Okay, so here's what we were talking about last time. We were talking about gradients. Remember, really, the big idea of a gradient is just kind of a it's it's a different point of view on a Jacobian matrix for a real valued function. Now, again, I can't emphasize enough. We've, we have to have a real valued function in order to talk about this because by having a real valued function, your Jacobian matrix has a single row and it's only by the virtue of the fact that it has a single row that you can reinterpret the directional derivative previously computed as a matrix product instead as being a dot product. So that's the big idea, right? Notice it all hinges on it being a real valued function. Okay, so... Um, that said, uh, the gradient vector, all it is, is just that special case, real value Jacobian matrix, turned sideways. I mean, it's the same thing. It's all the same. It's just, you know, the partial derivative just thought of as a vector, a, you know, a geometric object vector with a direction and a magnitude, you know, like all of the vectors we talked about, instead of being a matrix, namely a shorthand for a linear transformation. Okay. Uh, so we talked about the notation, new symbol you have to learn how to make. Right? So, you know, think it through. Uh, it, it happens every term that some people insist on writing it like this, and I just have to count off and mark it wrong because it's a problem. Uh, so uh, make sure you use the right notation and remember the formula. Very convenient formula. It's just all the partial derivatives. Right? Super easy to memorize. Um, new formula for how to compute real value directional derivatives, dot product with the gradient vector. Cool. Um, uh, so that's where we left off last time, as I recall. A couple of uh, quick observations uh, to make. Well, several here, so I don't, I don't need to number them. Here's our old Jacobian matrix. This is a general Jacobian matrix when you have several output values, right? So here we have, um, you know, F uh, from uh, Rn to Rm. We know it's from Rn to Rm because there are, you can see right here, m different output values that we're taking partials of to assemble our Jacobian matrix. Okay. Well, I, now this is just an observation, but notice that in fact then, each one of the rows of the Jacobian matrix, well, it's all the partial derivatives of that one output variable and is therefore the gradient vector of that output variable. So um, it's a nice way to think about it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, rows of the Jacobian matrix um, correspond to output variables. Namely, they're the gradients of the output variables. Remember, we talked previously about how the columns of the Jacobian matrix correspond to input variables. Columns are partials of the function with respect to certain corresponding input variables, rows, or gradients of output variables. Okay, so anyway, I just I think that's worth noting. Uh, if nothing else, it's 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 nice to see how you know there's lots of different kinds of derivatives that we're talking about uh, in this class, and it's interesting to see how they all fit together, um, and uh, you know they all sort of uh, show up inside of the Jacobian matrix. It's kind of neat. Okay, all right. So why go to all this trouble? Why take something that we had a perfectly reasonable understanding of? namely a Jacobian matrix, and insist on turning it sideways. Right? Who wins? What does this do for us? Well, uh, so I hinted at this last time. I guess I kind of said it, but um, the big point is that we have a dot product in this formula, and we have geometric interpretations of dot products. Not really so much with the matrix vector products that, that we have in the above formula, but since we have a geometric interpretation of dot product, we can hope to and we'll be successful in trying to make geometric interpretations of the gradient vector. And so that's going to happen. Uh, this gradient vector here, uh, we're going to make geometric conclusions about it that are really quite interesting and fundamental. Okay, so here we go. Um, I like to come at this from the point of view of uh, certain questions. So I'm going to start with uh, the following question. We've got a uh, real-valued function, of course. So some function f, real-valued. So z is the output variable, not that it matters. And uh, looking at this real-valued function, suppose I'm at some point in the domain, say here. Now, being at a point in the domain, we can talk about the partial derivatives of the function at that point. So we, therefore, we can talk about the gradient vector 
at that point. Let's draw that as well. Now here's the question I want to ask. It's a very reasonable question. Uh, I'm at this point A, and I would like to know, of all the different directions from the point A, you know, there's that direction, there's that direction, I guess there's the direction straight along the gradient, but there's plenty of other directions, lots of directions. Notice I'm using unit vectors to represent all these directions. Because right, I because I want to talk about directions exclusively. The question I'm about to ask is only about direction. It's not about speed. So the question is, of all the different directions, which direction would make the function increase the fastest? Now, uh, let me emphasize why I want to remove speed from the equation. I want to remove speed from the question because if the function's increasing somewhat fast as I move with that velocity, then it's going to be moving, moving really fast with that velocity, and it's going to be moving super duper fast with respect to that velocity. So you can see the silliness. The question devolves into nonsense. right? If you allow for non-unit vectors, then just, yeah, just make them bigger and bigger. right? There's no, There will be no answer to that question. Okay, so we consider only unit vectors. And, and, and it's a reasonable question at this point. There's only so many directions, and uh, in some directions the function's increasing faster, in some slower. Which one's the best? Okay, everybody happy with the question? All right, so there's a pretty straightforward answer to how to resolve this matter. Uh, here's what I want to... Um, what I want to address, and I've already forgotten my color, because I have blue for the gradient, yellow for directions. Okay, so... The gradient vector dot the unit vector representing my direction, that is going to compute the unit directional derivative that I want to maximize. Right? This is the thing I want to make as big as possible. Unit directional derivative. How fast the function going as I go in a certain direction. Which I know is computed as gradient dot u. Okay, so got an algebraic expression, I want to make it as big as possible. We now have an algebra problem. Let's use algebraic tools. Um, now, here's where the uh, the geometric understanding of the dot product comes in. This dot product, remember, flashback to chapter one. We can interpret dot products geometrically. Magnitude times magnitude times cosine of angle. Right, that's the foot in the door. That's what's going to allow us to draw geometric conclusions is the fact that we had geometric knowledge about that dot product. And uh, having done so, now a couple of observations. Uh, the magnitude of the u vector, by assumption, is 1. u is a unit vector. Right, so that just goes away. Um, as I consider all of these different directions, there's a bunch of different vectors u that I'm thinking about. But the gradient of f at this point, a, is is what it is. I mean, it, all that depends. Oh, the gradient of f only depends on a. It doesn't depend on which direction I'm going from a. So in this problem down here, uh, the gradient of f uh, for these purposes is constant. And furthermore, it's a positive constant. All right. So what I want to maximize, what I want to make as big as possible, is that. And this becomes a high school trig problem. I've got a positive constant times cosine theta. How do I make that as big as possible? The biggest value of cosine theta is 1. And I make cosine theta 1 by letting theta equal to 0. Okay, so um, theta is equal to 0 is the answer to our, to our question. Yeah, everybody on board? Now, what does this mean? What's the, I mean, how does this relate to gradient vector? Uh, go back up here and let's remind ourselves, uh, you know, what um, what was theta? So we found that, you know, for that unit vector, we need this angle here, theta, to equal to zero. Geometrically, what that means is that the best unit vector, well, the, the, the unit vector where that angle theta is zero is this one. The best unit vector is the one that points in the direction of the gradient vector. So let me say that a little bit differently. The direction of the gradient vector is the optimal direction. So that's geometrically natural, right? We have, a, we have this natural question, hey, which way is the function going the fastest? 
reasonable question, right? Hey, maybe maybe this function represents mosquito concentration per an old example, right? You know, which way do I run screaming to get away from the mosquitoes as fast as possible? Very relevant, right? Okay, maybe this function represents profit in some, uh, you know, I have a couple of parameters that are inputs that tell me what my profit is. And I want to know, you know, if I can only change my parameters so fast, but in what direction should I be changing my parameters for my company to, you know, uh, to, in, to maximize profit as quickly as possible, to decrease risk as quickly as possible? Very natural question to want to ask. The gradient vector, this thing, you know, it, and again, I remind you that we started from this conversation by saying I'm going to take the Jacobian matrix and just kind of turn it sideways, Right? This By this process of turning it sideways and interpreting as a vector, this is the answer to a very natural question. What's the direction in which the function's increasing the fastest? Um, and so, by the way, a little bit of terminology. Uh, this is what I like to, um, how I like to refer to this feature of the gradient, is that the gradient points in the direction of fastest increase. Yeah, everybody on board? Questions? Um, another lingo thing that I have to mention. Um, let's suppose that we were looking at the graph of this function. Now, you know, here we were not looking at a graph. Here we're looking at the domain separately. We're looking at the target separately. Uh, again, I've, I've you know said it a million times. You can't rely on graphs. It's a rare circumstance that you can even draw a graph, right? But this is one of those circumstances. If you have exactly two input variables, now if you have more than two input variables, forget. It. Not going to happen, right? But in this, as I've drawn it, situation, we can draw the graph, and let's sort of reinterpret what we've concluded here. Um, <clears throat> so again, I'm at this point in the domain. I'm doing this x y plane as being the domain. Uh, there is a gradient vector, and we we asked, we posed, you know, of all the different directions in the domain that I could conceivably go. Which one's going to make the function increase the fastest? We, we agreed that the answer was that uh, we'll go in the direction of the gradient vector. That makes the function increase the fastest, but don't forget this being a graph. Um, making the function increase as fast as possible is also making z increase as fast as possible. Namely, this is the direction that points uh, what I'm going to call uh, uphill. And if you think about it, that's the direction on this surface. Think of the surface as being like the, you know, a model of a mountain or a hill or something. That's the direction where is height increases the fastest. And you know, again, in casual parlance, that's what we call uphill. The gradient vector points uphill. Now, <coughs> minor uh, distinction. Again, you got to be careful a little bit by you know <coughs> interpreting things appropriately. Uh, the gradient vector it remains is in the domain. That's the gradient vector. I am not saying that this is the gradient vector. That's not the gradient vector, right? So I, I don't even know what. The, there's no name for that vector that I just crossed out, right? Um, gradient vector lives in the domain, but it points in the direction such that if you go that direction in the domain, then the point on the graph corresponding to it will be going uphill. So it's a little sloppy to say that it points uphill, but in this sense, you know what I mean. Yeah? Everybody happy? Questions? Okay. Um, so along these lines, uh, very often this feature that I prefer to call direction of fastest increase uh, sometimes it's referred to as uh, the direction of steepest ascent, which is fancy talk for uphill, right? Um, so it, you're, you're going to hear this one more often. Um, not super thrilled about that because, again, this point of view about steep ascent and uphill, this is uh, reliant on the assumption that you're viewing this in the context of a graph, which is not only not always the case, but it's usually not possible. Right? So this is a very narrow point of view on this interpretation of this property. But it's, the gradient's always the direction of fastest increase, and that makes no assumptions on the point of view that you're taking in understanding the function. So I, you know, uh, even though this is the more common term, I think, real, in my opinion, this is the better term. Okay. All righty. Um, related question. Um, okay. 
So we know what this ideal direction is. I know what direction to go to make my function increase as fast as possible. Um, how fast is the function increasing in that direction? What is the, you know, df ds, how fast, you know, per unit distance that I travel in that direction, how fast is the function increasing? Or uh, said differently, how steep is this hill from a graph point of view? Right? So it's one thing to know what direction uphill is. Uh, now that you've decided that you're going to hike uphill, pretty darn relevant, how steep is this mountain? Right? Um, so what is the value of that unit directional derivative? And again, easy calculation. Here's the formula for unit directional derivatives. Uh, we just agreed that the ideal direction, by assumption the direction we want to go, is, uh, is that. It's the unit vector in the direction of the gradient. And then look at this. Um, this, you know, what we have now for the unit directional derivative, we have a dot product of the gradient with itself. That's magnitude squared. Squ magnitude squared divided by magnitude is the magnitude of the gradient. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of cool how this has worked out as well. Not only is the direction of the gradient geometrically natural, it's the direction, it's the uphill direction, you know, it's the direction of fastest increase, but the magnitude of the gradient, also natural. It's how steep is that hill? It's how fast is the function increasing in that direction? So I think this is a lovely punchline. The direction of the gradient and the length of the gradient. Everything geometric about the gradient is, is relevant and interesting. Um, direction of fastest increase unidirectional derivative in that direction, slope in that direction if you want to talk about graphs. Okay. Neat punch lines. Is everybody happy with this? Okay. Right. Okay. Here's more. Turns out there's more interesting facts about the gradient vector. Um, this next one pertaining to level sets. And let me just go straight to the picture. Uh, now recall, if we have a real valued function, uh, very importantly in this case, a function with three input variables, not two input variables. I'm, in what I'm about to draw here, what I, what I have drawn here, um, we're not talking about a graph in any sense. Here, I made it a function of two variables so I could draw the graph and so that I could talk about the graph interpretation. Here, I'm not going to be talking about graphs. Here, I'm going to be talking about a level set of the function. So again, you got to make this this uh, gear shift in your head, you know, how you're interpreting the picture here now, a completely different interpretation than that last picture, right? And again, this is why I make a big deal about understanding the difference between graphs and level sets because there's going to be a different interpretation of the gradient vector. Okay, so anyway. So uh, here we go. The conclusion I'm going to show you is that if you're looking at a, you know, real value function and if you pick a point... Uh, a couple things you can do. One is you can take that point and you can plug that point into the function, see what the output value of the function is. We'll call that value C. You can then say, let's look at that level set. Namely, let's look at the level set that goes through that point. There will be exactly one level set of F that goes through that point. There's exactly one level set um, because A has exactly one output value. right? So, so we're looking at the level set that goes through A. Next question, you can talk about the gradient vector of f at a. And the amazing fact that I want to note here is um, that these are perpendicular. That's a really surprising fact, but this is always a right angle. Uh, let's see here, I'll use red. Uh, it's always a right angle right there. Gradients are always perpendicular to level sets. Again, big emphasis, it's got to be level sets. Gradients are not perpendicular to graphs. doesn't make any sense. It's not true. Right. Okay. okay, so uh, let me explain why this is true. I, you know what? Let me, let, me leave. let me leave some of that on here. I'm going to erase all of this, uh, but let me leave. The I want to emphasize that we're looking strictly in the domain here. So uh, here's why, and in fact, now let me come down to this related picture, so let me redraw that part. Um, real-valued function. Okay. 
Um, so here's the idea. If I want to show that at this point, if I want to show that the gradient is perpendicular to the surface, what I need to persuade you of is that if I take any tangent vector, whoops, oh, come on. If I take any tangent vector to the surface, that that tangent vector will be perpendicular to the gradient, right? If the, if the gradient's perpendicular to all the tangent vectors, then certainly the gradient's perpendicular to the set. Yeah? Seem like a reasonable assertion? So, okay, so we've got this, uh, we've got this tangent vector given to us. Now, a tangent vector, whatever tangent vector you give me, I can construct some curve uh, moving through the level set uh, for which this tangent vector is the velocity vector. Right? That's kind of what it means to be a tangent vector if you think about it. Right? So you can go in that that going in that direction is moving you along the surface. Okay, well let's take a curve that actually does move along the surface per that tangent vector. All right. Now this being in the level set by assumption. Oh, whoops, one of this in blue. This being in the level set, uh, let me note that that means that the value of the function doesn't change. The value of the function on this entire curve, on that entire curve, the value of f remains c. I haven't gotten off the level set. The whole point of the level set is all the values of the function on the level set are fixed constant c. All right, so that means that this derivative, as I go in, um, as I go in this direction, here let me say like so, like a green vector. As I go in that direction, as I take the derivative, in other words, uh, I get zero. So let me here, let me say like this. I'm going to take the derivative of that whole equation, and the derivative is zero. Oh, uh, there's another. Oh, there's another. Let me get one of those over there. This is very hard. Yeah, no worries. Not a problem. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. There we go. Okay. Um, right. So dftt is equal to zero. Of course it is. F is constant. F has to be constant because this curve stays on the level set. Now, here's another thing. Another way you can compute dftt. Right. We're moving. We're at a point. We're moving with a known velocity v. Dftt is the directional derivative. It's this. Uh, well, uh, anyway, at the, sure, whatever the value, whatever the point A is. That's kind of the idea of directional derivatives. And this directional derivative, we know, is gradient dot V. Right, so because of the fact that we're on a level set, that dftt is zero, and that tells us that the dot product with the gradient is zero. And that tells us that these two vectors are perpendicular as desired. You guys see how that argument works? Pretty cool argument. So another neat geometric fact about the gradient. You know, I, I, I just can never get enough of uh, this fact that, you know, we motivated the gradient by taking... This, this algebraically motivated thing, you know, the, the Jacobian matrix is motivated purely by algebra, right? And yet you take it and you turn your head sideways, view it as a column vector, and all of a sudden all these fantastic geometric properties uh, pop out. Um, the, uh, well, here it is, uh, the direction is the direction of fastest increase. The, the magnitude is the, you know, DFDS, or the slope, depending on your point of view. And furthermore, it's always perpendicular to level sets. And perpendicularity is geometrically natural. So anyway, um, neat properties of the gradient vector. Uh, a couple of quick applications. So uh, suppose you have uh, this function here. Now notice that this is real valued. Right? It's got to be real valued if you want to talk about gradient vectors. Okay. So um, um, let's uh, compute the directional derivative. This is an example we already did. We did this, uh, in fact, we've done this example twice. Previously, the first time we looked at this function at that point with that velocity, we did it brute force. 
We parameterized a line. We plugged in. We took the derivative. We set t equals zero. We got the whole you know painful, but direct, you know, uh, way of computing that directional derivative. We got some answer. Next, we, in, we reinterpreted that question with Jacobian matrices. Much easier to do it with Jacobian matrices. And now, uh, number three, and this is morally not that different, um, as we've discussed, this is basically the Jacobian matrix turned sideways. Right? So vector multiplying by the Jacobian matrix is the same as dot producting with the gradient vector and so we get morally the same arithmetic. It's not a matrix vector product. It's a vector dot product. Same numerical answer. Yeah? Everybody happy? Needed application? Okay. Um, next question. Um, this previous example here. This function at that point. Well, if we were going in the direction 2, 1, 3, we know what the derivative is. But now let's say, uh, okay, I'm, I don't, we're no longer going to assume we're going in that direction. Let's ask a different question of uh, in what direction is the function increasing the fastest? What direction should we be going, in other words? Forget about the direction we were going. What direction should we be going? And the answer is take the gradient, which we already know. Find the unit vector that points in the direction of the gradient. The gradient vector points in the direction of fastest increase. That's it's an immediate application um, of uh, what we just talked about. Yeah, everybody good? Okay. All right. Okay, here's a nice application. Here is a um, uh, real valued function. It's no real valued. And let's talk about the level set of this function through that point. Okay, all right, now slow down. We've got a function of three variables, right? There's three input variables, so the domain is like this. Uh, it's real valued. So the target is like that. Uh, this function, We can talk about a level set of that function. We can talk about some, I don't know, some some surface corresponding to some constant there. Right? Specifically, I want to talk about the level set um, that moves through this point one, three, two. So you know that's a certain point in the domain that has a certain value of the function. I want to talk about the level set that goes through that point, namely the level set that corresponds to this value. And uh, the equation is what's the the question is, what's the equation of the tangent plane? So at this point, I'm running out of colors again. I'll do it in yellow. At this point, there's a tangent plane to that surface at that point. How would I go about finding the equation of that tangent plane? Everybody see the question? Okay. Um, so, equation of the tangent plane. Well, it's, it's a kind of a sort of a chapter one problem, and we need two things to find the equation of this tangent plane. On the one hand, we need a point in this plane. Cool, I have a point. That was point was given one, three, two. And we're told we want the tangent plane at that point. Uh, next thing I need, though, is I need a normal vector. I need to find a vector that is perpendicular to this surface. You need to find a vector perpendicular to the surface because a vector perpendicular to the surface would be a vector that could be my normal vector, you know, perpendicular to my tangent plane. Yeah? Everybody happy? I need to find this in vector that's perpendicular to the surface. Can I think of a vector that's definitely perpendicular to this surface? This surface is a level set. Looking for a vector perpendicular to a level set, oh wait, that's what we just talked about, right? Um, gradient vectors are always perpendicular to level sets, right? So since we are, in fact, looking at a level set, right, we're looking at a level set. Looking at a level set, um, the gradient of this function is going to be the normal vector that I'm looking for. Let me say it differently. I can use the gradient 
as the normal vector that I'm looking for. And once you have the normal vector, then it's all over. It's just, you know, uh, a AX plus BY, all that business. Um, and now the arithmetically, yeah, those numbers are kind of inconvenient looking. But notice that, whoops, uh, it's just, oh, come on. Uh, it's just uh, AX plus BY plus CZ uh, equals D. Okay, right, so that's gradients. Um, moving on now to the next section, uh, the chain rule. Y'all remember the chain rule from Calc 1? I hope you remember the chain rule from Calc 1. I hope you're really good at the chain rule. Um, we have to do a lot of derivatives. Uh, exam 2, don't be surprised. There's going to be derivatives on it, right? So make sure you're really good at the single variable chain rule. Um, the multivariable chain rule has a lot in common with the single variable chain rule, but it's importantly different. Uh, the chain rule is, gosh, I, it's less a sort of computational symbolic trick and more a statement about how various kinds of things relate to each other. It's more of a conceptual thing than a, uh, than a, uh, than a, a shortcut. It, I think of the chain rule in single variable calculus as being kind of a shortcut, symbolic manipulation kind of a deal. So anyway, uh, I want to start by reminding you of uh, the conceptual point of view on the single variable chain rule. Here's a picture that shows a composition. Remember, the chain rule is a statement about derivatives of compositions. So here I have a function f where x goes in and y comes out. Composing that with a subsequent function g means that this y that had come out of f is going to go into g and out will come a third variable z. Right, so this is what it means to compose two functions. The composition takes x in uh, and gives z out. Yeah, everybody happy? By the way, I, I just you know notational nightmare, potential for catastrophe. Uh, I just want to remind you that the way we write this is uh, seemingly sort of backwards. So, f, which acts first, we draw it on the left in the diagram because that's what it looks like. I and mean, this is how we draw. We're the left to right culture. We tend to draw things on the left that act first, but in the notation for a composition, it's on the right. And I've bemoaned this previously, right? The one that's on the right in the diagram, because it acts second, is on the left in the algebra of the composition, because it acts second. Okay, so I hope everybody remembers that. Um, I got burned really bad on this one time. Um, something morally equivalent to this, it wasn't exactly this, but it was um, uh, more sophisticated objects, but morally the same idea. Um, uh, it was a research problem I was working on as a grad student, and I made this mistake. I got it backwards at the very beginning of a very long calculation. And you understand, in grad school, a very long calculation does not mean a calculation that took you like 45 minutes. Now, in grad school, a long calculation is a calculation that takes you a month. <laughs> I got stung hard on this. I had to take a stack of papers the size of this homework set and drop it in a trash can. I, it, it hurt. Right? I do not make this mistake anymore. Right? <laughs> so please learn from my pain. Uh, <laughs> right? I don't want that to happen to y'all. Um, okay. All right. Okay, so uh, right, so y'all remember the chain rule. Now I'm going to give you a point of view on the chain rule. Is this way I like to think about it? And furthermore, this is a way that's going to extend naturally to a multivariable context. So this is an important point of view. Um, different ways to think about the derivative, but one way to think about the derivative is it's a relationship between input changes and output changes. So f prime is a relationship between these two vectors. And in the single variable context, it's a number, right? It's what you it's it's what you multiply by the left vector to give you the right vector. Or let me say that's different. It's what you multiply by the left speed to give you the right speed. Right? Okay. So it's a factor. It's what you multiply. All righty. Um, G prime is what you multiply by that vector to get this other vector. Right, so it, I mean, I just appeal to your. I mean, you can look at the algebra if you want at all the algebras right here. But let me just appeal to your sense of how multiplication works. If this 
If you get from the first vector to the second vector by multiplication by f prime, and if you get from the second to the third by multiplication by g prime, all together, you see, first you multiply by f prime, and then you multiply, there's that, there's that, um, the thing, so fear not. Right, this is a test. It is 10 o'clock. Eh, it's close enough to 10 o'clock. I'm pretty sure this is a test. Um, if you need to do something with your phone, that's fine. If you want to evacuate, you, you can. This is being recorded. Um, I think we're good. Um, okay, so multiplying by f prime is what you do to get from there to there. Multiplying by g prime is what you do to get from there to there. All together, you multiply by f prime, and then having had done that, you multiplied by g prime. All together, you've multiplied by f prime times g prime. Right? So the relationship between you know, that vector and that vector, all together, what you multiply for, by the one vector to get the other vector, namely, what is the derivative of that composition? It's f prime times g prime. Yeah. Um, so when you're using uh, matrices to represent the transformations, yeah. Um, so you, it's left multiplying f prime and then left multiplying g prime. Oh, we uh, well, let's get to that in a second. Okay. So for right now, this is just scalars. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Just just scalars. This single variable only. So anyway, this is how you write um, uh, the chain rule in single variable calculus. Um, let's see. Well, let me, let me. Here it is. This is more completely. Um, the derivative of the composition, let me get to a better color. Derivative of a composition, it's f prime times g prime. And let me let me get rid of the what's in parentheses. It's f prime times g prime. Oversimplified. Okay, so I hope that looks familiar. By the way, if you wanted to go, you know, Leibniz notation on this, uh, dz dx is uh, dz dy times uh, dy dx. And notice specific, it's the product of the two individual derivatives. Right? It leaps off the page in Leibniz notation. Okay. Okay, now a quick point of order. Um, what's the deal? This confused me when I first saw it. What's the deal with the fact that f prime is evaluated at a and g prime is evaluated at f of a? Why do you have to stick that f into there? Well, because that's where G is evaluated, right? Let, let's, let's talk about why F prime is evaluated at A. We evaluate F prime at A because we're evaluating F at A. That's, what, that's where we're talking about. As far as F is concerned, A is the input value. So A is where we evaluate F prime. Okay, related to that, now, why do we put in F of A into G prime? because G is being evaluated at that point, which is F of A. Right? I mean, by assumption, we're composing these functions, and so what goes into the second function, G, is what comes out of the first function, F. So it's, it, it, you know, I, I always kind of had this urge to be fair about it all and make it G prime of A, but that doesn't make any sense. G, the function G has never heard of A. A is not even in its domain. And the domain for G is the y-axis. It doesn't make any sense at all. Okay. Okay, so um, the multivariable version is really the exact same argument with a slight twist. Um, here's the picture. Here is a composition of functions. We have a first function, f. This is a multivariable function from R2 to R2, as I have it drawn. It could be, could be anything. Okay. Um, then we're composing that with this multivariable function, again, as I have it drawn from R2 to R2, whatever. Um, so F first, G second, um, and all together the composition goes from the domain of F to the target of G. So, you know, as it turns out, still R2 to R2 in this case. And the composition, G compose F just says, well, first do F and then do G. Well, if you do, if you compose these functions like this, you can talk about this point, which will have an image in the Y world. It'll have an image in the Z world. If that point takes off and starts moving with some velocity, then its image over here is going to move, I don't know, some other velocity. And this subsequent image is going to be moving with whatever other velocity. There's going to be these various vectors that represent input and output velocities of these various different functions. And they're all related by derivatives. Now, in Calc 1, 
the way we relate input and output vectors, right, the relationship between these two things is multiplication by a number. The derivative is a number that you multiply by the left one to get the right one. Th that's not how multivariable derivatives work, right? There's multivariable derivatives are different. Um, the most fundamental way that I like to think of in relating these two vectors is that they're related by a linear transformation, right? The related, we talked about this last time. They're related by the derivative transformation. So you take the left vector, you apply df, Uh, I don't think that's quite legible, is it? Uh, hang on a second. Uh, D, F, there we go. You take that left vector, you apply the linear transformation D, F to get the right vector, or the middle vector. And what do you do to the middle vector uh, to get the, the right vector? Well, input vector, output vector, um, they're related by way of, again, a linear transformation. The derivative transformation of G. So first you apply DF, then you apply DG, which I think answers your question. Um, and all together, what have you done? It, it, by taking the left vector, by taking you know um, uh, v, what I've called V, by applying DF, and then subsequently applying DG, all together you have in effect. Uh, Taken V, resulted in U. You've taken uh, the input of the composition, you've taken its velocity, and you've gotten the output velocity of the composition all together. That action is the same as multiplying by the derivative, uh, excuse me, applying the derivative transformation D of G compose F. So the assertion I make here, totally analogous to the single variable, uh, argument is that the action of this one linear, the, the yellow linear transformation, the yellow linear transformation is the same as the composition of first green linear transformation, then purple linear transformation. So yellow equals, and you have to say it in the right order, of course, yellow is equal to purple composed green. Right? And uh, so again, you can write down all the algebra if you'd like. Here's the, the punchline. Um, uh, yellow, the derivative of the composition, is purple compose green. So here's what the chain rule looks like. Oh, this is this is uh, what you might call the Newton um, sort of like notation of the the chain rule in uh, in multivariable. It's not that derivatives multiply, it's that derivative transformations compose. It's more, again, but the same idea, right? Inputs, what had been out, what's become inputs, and this followed by that is the same as the doing it all at once, and the, the argument's morally equivalent, it just ends up with a different punchline. Now also remember, of course, that composition of linear transformations corresponds to multiplication of corresponding matrices. So another way to say the same thing is that we're multiplying Jacobian matrices. Composition of derivative transformations, multiplication of Jacobian matrices. So take your pick, right? I mean, my own point of view, for whatever it's worth, is that this is the most fundamental. You are composing linear transformations. Ultimately, that's the at the bottom of it all is what's really going on. But day in and day out computationally, oh yeah, no, multiplying Linear multiplying uh, Jacobian matrices is computationally the way to think about it. So make sure you know both of these formulas, but uh, in practice, definitely that one. Everybody on board? Okay. All right, so let me show you an example. Uh, I'm going to kind of work up in complexity to, with examples. I'm going to start with one where I give us the Jacobian matrices. Now, you know, these two functions, I could have, I could have given you, okay, the, the function f has the following formulas, and the function g has the following formulas, and we could spend a bunch of time in this example cranking out loads of partial derivatives to actually construct these matrices, but that'd be a bunch of algebra that's stuff y'all already know how to do. It's stuff we've already covered, right? So rather than repeat a bunch of stuff we've already covered, let me just suppose we're composing these functions, and we'll skip to the punchline. These are the Jacobian matrices. Okay. 
All right. Now, that said, we've got to worry about what's evaluated where. Uh, I am a big believer in making what I like to call little road maps. Um, we are looking at G compose F. That means that F acts first. Be careful. All right, so F acts first. F is from R2 to R3. Uh, then uh, let's see here. G acts second. G is from R3 to R3. So this is uh, kind of a little road map of what's going on. I like to call it road map. Now, we also want to give names to these variables. Uh, when I was writing this exercise, uh, this example, um, I was a little sloppy. Uh, I should have, to be fair, given names to these variables because in the question I asked for partials of, you know, with respect to certain variables. So I should have stated it. Um, when I wrote this, I was I was thinking about making, you know, sort of conventional choices about what to call various variables. So my intention was that we're going to think of these input variables here as x1 and x2. Um, and uh, these, you know, the outputs from G as being G1, uh, G2, G3. So the question asks, the intention of this question was to find the partial derivative of that variable with respect to that variable. Well, to find the whole Jacobian matrix, but then also that one specific partial derivative. Okay, so my bad. I really should have stated that in the example. Uh, quick note on an exam. I, I don't think I'll be this careless on an exam, but you know, I make mistakes as we all do. Um, if on an exam, if there is an ambiguity, if the question asks about uh, something pertaining to variables that were not mentioned in the statement of the question, I might have just blown it, right? It might have com completely have been inadvertent accident on my part. Come up and ask during the exam. I will clarify. Okay. All right. So, um, now, uh, let's uh, look at what we're given. Oh, by the way, we know we're going to need to have uh, names for these variables. Let's go ahead and make a choice here. Let's call these uh, y1, uh, y2, and y3. And call them anything we want. <clears throat> Seems like a reasonable choice. Uh, now, we're given specifically that, let's see here, f of 1, 2... Uh, is three one zero. We're given that, All right? And we need to be careful and think about that because notice these Jacobian matrices that are given to us uh, are given with kind of that in mind. Uh, the Jacobian of F is given at the point one two, and notice that the Jacobian of G, oh, whoops, different color. Jacobian of G is given at the point 310. So very importantly, the Jacobian of G has not been given at some random other point. The Jacobian of G has been given at F of A. Right, so if we're going to cite this rule up here, I need for the Jacobian of G to be given at F of A. Yeah? Okay. Okay, um, okay so... This is laid out for immediate application to this rule here. Right. Uh, we're just going to, uh, in order to understand the Jacobian matrix of the composition, um, color choices, uh, in order to understand the Jacobian of the composition, we're going to multiply green times red. Oh, wait a second. Let's think about the order. Which one goes first? Uh-oh. Right. Got to worry about this. Get it backwards. It's going to mess you up. Right. F is first, G is second. In the diagram, that means F is on the left. But in the chain rule, that means F is on the right. Because on the right is first when you write, when you multiply matrices. Right? First. Second. That said, you have the matrices in the correct order. Matrix multiplication. Boom. There's your Jacobian matrix. Oh, blue. Sorry. There's Jacobian of the composition. Everybody happy with that part so far? Okay. Okay. So, um, 
Oh, the other part of the question, the second part of the question says, what's the value of partial of G3 with respect to X1? Okay, third output variable, first input variable. Now remember, output variables correspond to rows. Input variables correspond to columns. So what this says is I want to be in the uh, third row, first column, So that partial derivative is 3. Yeah? Okay. All right. Moving along. Um, okay. Um, this is a different point of view you can take on the chain rule. Uh, this is uh, it has different uses. I don't want to say it's better, and I don't want to say it's not as good. Uh, in some situations, what I'm about to show you is better. In some situations, what I'm about to show you is uh, pretty incomplete and not very useful. So this is an alternative point of view. So here it is. Um, I'm going to just, I mean, here's our chain rule. This is our existing chain rule. I've just exploded this into, you know, writing down the individual elements of these Jacobians. Um, uh, notice uh, z is a function of y, y is a function of x, and I want to understand the partials of z with respect to x. So that's the order of these variables here. Writing it all out. Now, don't forget how matrix multiplication works. Matrix multiplication says that if you want to understand a particular element of a matrix, you take the corresponding row of the left matrix and you dot with the corresponding column of the right matrix. Right? Chapter 3, that's just how multiplication works. So I get these numbers, dot these numbers. And lo and behold, what you have is uh, kind of a different formula. Instead of this, I mean, great big monstrosity. <laughs> right? Look how many, look how much stuff there is in that equation. It's uh, a little intimidating, really. Right? Um, you get a relatively compact thing, and it is the case sometimes. By the way, that you just, you know, sometimes that you don't care about all these other things. I don't. If you don't need to know all of these other things, why write down something that that addresses all of those uh, partial derivatives that you might just not care about at all, right? So if you only want to know a single particular partial derivative, uh, this is a little bit more compact. Right? So I encourage you to uh, to memorize this formula. Now, that also looks like something that would be really easy to get confused. Let me give you a point of view on how to think about that. This is the way I think about it anyway. Um, this is what I like to call um, uh, propagation of changes. Right? The idea is these uh, <clears throat> things, uh, not that they're really things, but um, these, let me just say differentials to give them a name. Um, they represent changes under certain circumstances. So that one there says, okay, suppose that I change xj by some amount, holding all the other variables constant. It's a partial derivative. Okay. So that represents a change. And this represents the corresponding change in the variable ym. So, you know, how much does ym change when xj changed? So, um, so, so what we have here is a statement about relationship between various kinds of changes. So I make the following observation. Um, we're interested in what happens when xj changes a little bit. We've got all our x variables over here. We've got our y variables there. We've got our z variables over here. I'm going to change, according to what this says, I'm going to change just xj, only xj changes, and altogether, I'd like to know how much does that one output variable zi change. I don't really care about the other z's. I just want to know about zi. Well, a bunch of stuff's going to happen. Um, here's the thing. When you change xj, on the one hand, that is going to cause y1 to change. Oh, whoops, I highlighted the wrong one. When you change xj, that is going to cause y1 to change. So there is a there is a change that's happening along what I'm going to call that arrow. Right? Y1 is, among other things, dependent on xj. So for every xj change, that causes a change in y1. But here's the thing. A change in y1 causes uh, a change in zi. So there's a propagation along that arrow 
to cause a change in ZI. So now what's the, what's the, uh, the, the combined effect if, if there's a factor that you multiply by a change in XJ to get a change in Y1, and there's another factor that you multiply by a change in Y1 to get a change in ZI, as the changes have propagated along that path, altogether you take the product of those two things. So we're taking um, the, oh, I made a bad color choice there. Let me make this darker blue. Um, we have that factor times that factor. Yeah, is everybody on board? So as XJ changes, error uh, changes propagate along what I'm going to call the Y1 path to contribute to changes in ZI. All right, so now let me rewrite this picture a little bit. Um, uh, by way of Y1, here is a contribution to how much XJ changes increase ZI changes. Just, you know, multiplication of factors. Um, then you just have to recognize that, well, that's not the only path. If you change XJ, Y1 is not the only thing to change. Y2 changes also. That product represents how much changes in XJ propagate through Y2 to cause changes in ZI. And that contributes sort of simultaneously with the Y1 contribution, right? Et cetera, et cetera along the last intermediate variable, the last path through which changes can propagate, uh, we get that term. So th this is the way I remember this formula. I, you know, I would encourage you to know, don't just one character at a time memorize this formula. There's a lot of characters, right? Think of this as, well, look, at all this. each one of these terms simply represents different paths along which changes in XJ can contribute to changes in ZI. And thus, their sum gives me the combined extent to which changes in XJ can cause changes in ZI. Okay. All right. So that's a way to think about it. Ends up being really useful in a lot of contexts. Okay. So, for example, um, in the previous question, now in the previous question, it did ask us to compute the whole Jacobian. If you wanted to compute a whole Jacobian, don't do it this way. I'm like, oh my gosh, what a nightmare. If you had to do the whole Jacobi in this way, you'd be writing down this formula uh, six different times. That would not be an efficient way to do it. A far more efficient way, if you want to compute the whole Jacobian, uh, is let matrix multiplication do the bookkeeping for you. Super convenient. For sure. Yeah? Everybody on board? Okay. But if you only want to compute just the one partial derivative, that's it. You need to know just this thing here. All you really need are these numbers and those numbers that you multiply like so. And pick right out of the given matrices and Boom, there's your answer. So you save yourself a bunch of arithmetic. Yeah? Okay. All right. Um, please do beware of one thing. It's really easy to make the following mistake. I see this every year. I make, a, I make a big deal out of it every time I teach this class, and invariably there's a certain number of students that do this. Um, it always, again, gives me the willies whenever I see students be like, oh, yeah, those cancel. Oh man, because there is kind of a point of view there, and if you if you make a more sophisticated understanding of of single variable derivatives, this does make sense. But it, it, there's ideas in play there that most sing, most Calc one students have not seen, so it, it's a little oh uncomfortable. It's worse than that in multivariable calculus. In multivariable calculus, if you if you believe this that you can just cancel that you know whenever there's something on the numerator that looks just like the thing in the denominator, you're welcome to just cancel. You're going to make some massive errors, and you can see how that would show up in this calculation here. Every year, I see students write down this and forget about these terms, and their argument, their reasoning is, well, those cancel. Right? 
very tempting, and really wrong. I mean, big time wrong. Everybody see the problem? So please don't step on that little particular landmine. It's a really easy mistake to make. Um, it's highly encouraged by this little this little move that come up in a lot of Calc 1 classes, right? which again, you know, in a Calc 1 class, it, it's really kind of sort of true in a way and properly dealt with, but uh, in a multivariable calculus class, no, it doesn't work at all. So heads up. Don't be, there's going to be at least one person in this class based on my experience that's going to do exactly that. Don't let that be you. Okay. All right. Okay, so a uh, quick warning about confusion of variables. Um, I, and I'm going to go back to a Calc 1 example. Um, I, I, I like to start with, I like analogies. And so I like to see, you know, what does is, what is the issue look like that I want to talk about in Calc 1? And let's see how in multivariable it's really kind of the same thing. So you all remember this um, uh, issue. So suppose you have uh, f of x is x squared. That's cool. That's a function. It's a perfectly reasonable way to talk about it. g of x is x cubed. Yeah, it's a perfectly reasonable way to talk about that function. Two different functions. Now, suppose I say I want to compose these functions and take a derivative. Reasonable question. You might... At some point want to do this, right? Here's an easy mistake to make. Some students will play a little too fast and loose with the chain rule. Product of the derivatives. They'll take the derivative of f, which is clearly 2x, and the derivative of g, which is clearly 3x squared, and just multiply them and get 6x cubed, which of course is wrong. All right, now... What did the student do wrong? What the student did wrong is, uh, again, you know, this, this isn't really just g prime. It's certainly not g prime of x. Right? It's g prime of f of x. Yeah? Right? And that's the rule. I mean, so uh, you got to be careful with that. So um, what you've got to do is plug f of x into g prime, right? So this, it shouldn't be 3x squared, it should be 3f of x squared. Namely, it should be uh, 3x squared squared. And you end up with 6x to the fifth, and that's the right answer. Yeah? Okay, so... That's one way to look at it. Like, let me show you what I think is a better way to look at it. Or, uh, this is, you know, I have a strong preference for this. And I, you know, I think this is going to save you a lot of trouble. A strong preference is that while I had, while I did note at when we first started this problem, that there's nothing wrong with talking about f in terms of a dummy variable called x, and there's nothing wrong with talking about g in terms of a dummy variable called x. As soon as I decide that I want to compose those functions, it becomes a problem. What are my choices of dummy variables? Um, uh, effectively, what I've done here is I've I've got this situation where I'm going to take uh, f and I'm going to compose it with g, and I want to think of x. Excuse me, I want to think of x as being the input variable for f, but I also want to think of it as the input variable for g. But that would mean it's the output variable for f. That means I've confused my variables. Now x is playing two different roles. It's both the input and the output to the same function. That doesn't make any sense, right? So this is what we'll call confusion of variables. So simple solution to this is that once, you know, even though by itself there's nothing wrong with that, and by itself there's nothing wrong with that, once you decide you want to compose, you need to reconsider what you're going to call that variable. In other words, you need to reconceive of how you're going to describe this function g. You really shouldn't think of it as being a function of x. you just got to reinterpret g as being a function of a different dummy variable. Ah, doesn't change g. g is still the you know, qubit function. Right? It doesn't change what g is at all. It's just we're writing it in terms of a different variable. And in effect, what we're doing there is we're just making the choice uh, to call this y instead of x. Now there's no confusion of variables. Yeah, sure, y is the input to g. It's the output from f. y is equal to f of x. There's no confusion, no issue. And you can be as sloppy as you want. 
in how you write the chain rule. So here's your here's your sloppy point of view on the chain rule, um, derivative compositions, product of derivatives, and <clears throat> let's see here, g prime. Right, let me do it like this. Uh, the derivative of y cubed. I mean, not even worrying about what evaluates where. It's three y squared. And the, the derivative of f. 2x. And just write it down. Fast and loose. Don't sweat it. And the choice of notation has done it for has kept track for us of what we need to do. Specifically, the fact that this is y, right? The fact that it's the input to g means that it's the output to f, which means that that y has to become x squared. So it reminds you, by your choices, to avoid confusion of variables. Everybody happy? So this is my suggestion. Just, you know, once you realize that you want to make this choice, I'll just do it here. Once you realize that you're composing some functions, you should have a, uh, the hair on the back of your head should start to stand up. You get worried, oh gosh, we're composing these? I didn't know we were going to compose them. Uh-oh, did I confuse my variables innocently? None, not knowing at the time there was going to be something wrong with it, right? But nevertheless, you got to look back and see, did I accidentally confuse my variables? And if so, consciously make the change. Everybody see what I mean? Okay, so um, that's a single variable analysis. Um, I, same thing happens in multivariable. Here's a couple of functions. There's nothing wrong with how I've written either of these functions. Until I decide that I want to compose them and compute a Jacobian matrix, but more more to the point, when I, as soon as I say I want to compose them, now I've got a confusion of variable situation, and I really need to rename uh, the variables. Uh, this this function g, the one that's going to go second, should not be in terms of x's and y's. It should be in terms of something else, and whatever I call it in terms of. Let's see here. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to rewrite g. Same function g now in terms of u and v. Whatever is the input, whatever are the new input variables for g, those are the output variables from f. Right? So when you redo the variables there, you're saying, you're giving names to what the outputs of f are. Right? So the output there, we'll do it like this. The outputs from F are the inputs to G. And uh, now at this point, again, you know, be as careless as you want. Jacobian of G, Jacobian of F. You have this automatic reminder uh, in the form of the fact that this is written as a U there. That's an automatic reminder that you need to rewrite U in terms of X's and Y's. Does the bookkeeping for you. Okay. All right. Last thing I want to talk about is uh, second derivatives. Um, so uh, quick observation. I don't want to go through these details partly because we don't have time, but I just want to make a, an observation. We've talked about second derivatives. Calc 1, they talk about second derivatives. Um, Calc 1 talks about the chain rule, how to take derivatives of compositions. They never talk about how to take second derivatives of compositions. A little weird if you think about it, right? Maybe you have a composition. Maybe you want to take a second derivative. So Calc 1's attitude about this, and I, I don't really blame them. It makes sense in context. Calc 1's attitude is take the first derivative, <clears throat> this resulting function that you have, take another derivative of it. Just use the chain rule twice. Right? And they don't feel the need to sort of, uh, yeah, but where is a, a, an all-encompassing, one-time, one-step hammer uh, solution to that problem? Uh, they just say, just you know, apply the chain rule twice. Um, so it turns out that in multivariable contexts, you really do need to have uh, better ways to deal with that question. So specifically, um, this is a situation that comes up. By the way, I, I mentioned this before. I did a second major in physics. This kind of thing is a big deal in physics, um, and I sort of assume also in engineering. So suppose we have some function that depends on x and y, highly plausible. Suppose I want to reconceive of that as being a function of r and theta, 
maybe I know the calculus of this function in rectangular coordinates. What's the corresponding calculus of this function in terms of polar coordinates? Or maybe vice versa. Maybe I, maybe I know very conveniently what the calculus is in polar coordinates, but I need to know the calculus in rectangular coordinates. What's the relationship between these yellow derivatives and these green derivatives? And it's kind of a big deal. I mean, you're doing physics, you want to understand like the Laplacian. You remember in, in the partial derivative section I had y'all computing Laplacians? It's very, very important in physics, and it's written in terms of rectangular second derivatives. Very often, functions that you're dealing with are written in spherical coordinates. So understanding relationships between spherical second derivatives, which are easy to compute, and rectangular second derivatives, which are you know, natural, physically natural, very big deal, big time saver. Um, so these kinds of calculations are very important. So I just want to observe how this works. Uh, if you, let's suppose I want to compute the second partial of... Um, second partial of z with respect to r. Here's our diagram. The first partial of z with respect to r. There are these two different paths. Two different intermediate variables, x and y, between r and z. And so the chain rule, you know, this intermediate variable's propagation of changes point of view on uh, the chain rule gives us uh, this formula for that first derivative. And uh, by the way, very often it's going to come up that certain aspects of what you've written down you can compute. So you know, x is a function of r and theta um, in a really natural way. So I already know. You don't, this is, you don't need to keep that general. The partial of x with respect to r is cosine theta. right? It's rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates, that relationship's fixed. Ditto with spherical coordinates. OK, so you can rewrite some of what you've got. Don't forget this notation, this alternative notation for partial derivatives. Uh, it's going to be super convenient <laughs> in this case to think of partial of z with respect to x uh, a little bit more compactly. Okay. So the big observation I want to make here is that if, when I take a second derivative, this zx, I'm going to have to take a partial somehow with respect to r. Right? If I'm going to take an r partial, of everything in here, I'm going to need to know what is the r partial of zx. This diagram is not helping me. zx is not on the diagram. What are the intermediate variables? What is zx a function of? And how do you do the chain rule to understand the partial of zx with respect to r? So my suggestion is, um, in order to see that, think through that if z is a function of x and y, so is zx. And so if you want to take the r partial of zx, there are again two paths along which changes can propagate. Therefore, there's two intermediate variables. Therefore, there's two terms in taking that partial derivative. Okay, and so details uh, are here, and I just want to you know, walk through this. In the, we've got 50 seconds. Let's see how much progress we can make. Um, and I'll finish this up on, um, uh, on tomorrow. But here's that first partial of z with respect to r. Product rule. You hope you all remember the product rule, right? Uh, likewise here, product rule. Um, good news, you won't always get this lucky, but we did here the partial of cosine theta with respect to r, the partial of sine theta with respect to r, those are zero. r and theta are independent variables. So those terms go away. Right? And all we're left with then are um, this term and that term. And notice specifically then I need to know what is the partial of zx with respect to r And I need to know what is the partial of zy with respect to r as well. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna write those down with the chain rule next time. I ran out of time, but um, it's 
straight application of what we just said. See y'all later.